All right, well, um, looking back over the past couple days, uh, one of the things we wanted to do is instead of having you guys leave thinking there's absolutely nothing we can do to actually build a high performance building envelope without, you know, uh, without bringing on air barrier guys and, 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 you know, burning a bunch of insulation to only to find out you, you needed to go back and redesign it so you can burn it again uh, or, or do all the thermal bridging analysis. Uh, we wanted to kind of give a look at what some of the systems out there today that actually work uh, could be, uh, and, and maybe not right now, but look into the future. And um, what I can tell you is I got a little gift for you uh, late in the afternoon that this is going to get relatively short because there isn't a ton of high performance walls that actually work. Um, <laughs> As not and and I loved uh, Mark's comment about we can get them to work for ASHRAE, we can get them to work for LEED, we can get them to work, we can get them to paper out and they look golden. But when we actually uh, pour over all the stuff we're starting to understand uh, about wall assemblies and roof assemblies and really put them through the ringer of what works and what doesn't, we're realizing really quickly that we're not working. Um, the numbers we're putting on these things aren't truly what we're getting out of them. Um, here's a high performance wall system going up at, I won't list which installation, but um, I, how many, I mean, it doesn't take more than five seconds to find at least a couple flaws with this high performance wall system going up. Um, it's an R15.2 exterior insulation. They're going to put a little bit of, uh, uh, of, of um, spray foam on the inside along with a, it's a cocktail of spray foam and some bat. And so, yeah, you, you got some thermal bridging I heard already uh, immediately with the through all flash there because someone didn't think that uh, what happened, you know. So when we build mock-ups like this, I go out and I, you know, I have to laugh. The project's already in full swing. We know we can get there. Everybody's bought off on it because we've papered out. We've completely shown that this is a high performance wall, but everybody, everybody who knows anything about the wall knows we're not getting there. And so one thing I like to say at the mock-ups is let's hook up some jumper cables to the front of this and everybody get on the back and touch the, the studs. Who, who, who's in? And uh, that's conductivity. Uh, we we got to watch out for that. And so um, when, we're looking at, um, the, when we're looking at our high performance wall systems, there's a, dun there's a ton of different things we can use. Um, some of them a lot more uh, uh, kind of groundbreaking technology. Others, uh, not so much. There's the SIPS panels that were referenced earlier going in. Um, great concept. Unfortunately, they're made out of wood that really limits us a lot of times um, uh, where we can use it. Uh, another thing that people don't like about it is you don't get all your, uh, laying in all your utilities. Where, wh how can we hide them in the wall now? Um, it, it becomes a little bit of a problem. We've used SIPS on a few uh, uh, projects for the Corps of Engineers. We've had wonderful results schedules. Uh, uh, we used them in uh, actually in Fairbanks uh, where we had such a limited construction schedule timeline that we were able to slap the building together really really quick with this and uh, and it, it, it works well. Um, spray foams. Uh, so uh, one thing a comment that got made to me yesterday afternoon and I kind of went back and re revised some of this um, is we've got we've got some experts that live breathe you know, uh, just you know, you know what I my wife tells me when I dream. A lot of times I yell out air barrier, and so <laughs> this is what we do. And so we started just going full steam ahead. And and some of this stuff might be new. And so I'm trying to slow it down a little bit. And expanded polystyrenes. That's the white stuff, the beadboard, the stuff that you can kind of break up with your hand into little white flakes. Polyiso um, is your yellow. You usually see it in roofs, but we are putting it in walls now. Extruded polystyrene, that's your XPS, and I think somebody said yesterday, pink, blue, and sometimes green. Um, and so all, all great products um, when we look at insulation in walls. Our mineral fibers, um, definitely uh, uh, not, it's, it's an interesting group of people who that really stand behind this, and the people that do love it. And, and I've, I've worked on teams with this as a building envelope uh, consultant, and we've gotten the job done. Um, it's just one of those things that, you know, there's two ways to look at it. Either the winter coat uh, is, is wet, but is it still keeping me warm? And then, you know, 
so you know when but when you wear a wetsuit you got water next to you and you're keeping that warm and so it's interesting to get a, a mineral fiber wet in the cavity and see what happens um, spray polyurethane foam no really uh, spray polyurethane foam this does get done and it's a really good idea just don't smoke I mean the 20 foot from the uh, the doorway I'd make it 120 feet so um, spray foam uh, is a wonderful answer it's uh, often the answer to it it's the quick answer it's too easy of an answer um, there's there's things that can go wrong with spray foam as well and the, the hurdles that we look at when we're looking at our high performance building envelopes is the thermal bridging we're not going to talk about any more about that I promise um, because there's guys that do it and they do it really well we just heard from two masters of it um, structural fastening uh, another thing we've, we've been looking at that the the patio uh, attachment on on uh, the high performance patio attachment this is a big one uh, I know that, that has stung people for many years um, but the biggest one right now, the limiting factor, there's ways around, uh, let's see, there's ways around these, the thermal bridging and the structural fastening. It just uh, often result, results in just money. Um, it, you just have to do, use more money. The fire code we talked about earlier this morning, Weg D uh, and, and Linda had great presentations and, and a lot of discussion came in from the floor. And so really that's the biggest hurdle right now. It's, it's holding us back. And it's not holding us back from current, uh, current insulation values, but I'm talking about what about the high, not just one, uh, not just high performance as paper high performance, but really when we want true, true high performance, um, what's holding us back, and it, it is the fire code. We wanna, guys like me wanna push more and more insulation to the exterior, and, and we're just getting into, into trouble with that. Um, like I said, Linda did a far better job than I ever would uh, in presenting this earlier today. So I'm going to whip through these and not bore you to death. But um, you can see the problem that, that, that has been, my perspective, blown way out of proportion. Um, that this is, this is not a problem that, that, you know, they've got a few pictures and, and you can only find a few pictures. It hasn't been a major issue. Um, the things to remember that I like to point out about the test uh, is uh, the, the, the bottom one here. Even though a specific component of the wall assembly has met the requirements, if additional combustible components are added to the wall assembly, then the wall the assembly may no longer meet NFP 285. And that's where we start getting into multiple tests based on multiple different uh, uh, intersections coming together. You know, some projects are so big they've got different architects working on different areas of the building, and so we we do, we do need to uh, we do need to uh, be be very cautious of where this 285 has taken us in the precedence it's setting. So this is mentioned earlier, the, 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 cons the code compliance report, what we're looking for, and, and kind of like Linda spelled out, there is a, uh, a systematic way with multiple uh, different scenarios. The, the one thing that we are limited right now is we aren't seeing enough insulation. No one's testing at that level. And um, uh, the reason being is the code the prescriptive code that we can paper past um, isn't pushing it there yet. So these are the almost the exact same tables that Linda had earlier. So um, you guys can see all those. Example walls that work. Um, the EFS. The EFS community passes 285 because that's who it was developed for. And um, this is, uh, I, I talked about drive it earlier. This is the BA, BASF uh, uh, EFS system. And it's um, uh, it's almost darn near exact to drive it in the ways you can use it. Um, it takes care of thermal bridging if it's done right. Um, it takes care of the structural fastening if it's done right. And you can do about uh, up to R65 walls, um, and that's just the CI, that's just outboard of your sheathing. Um, water, vapor, and air, a lot, you know, the EAPS problems that we had back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, they, they, that's not, if, if it's done right, we can do it right. And, um, and, and we can actually do the through walls with uh, taking into account the thermal bridging. And so this EFS is, is something that works. Luckily, EFS has a, uh, is a for your market, um, EFS is a very, uh, you guys are using it everywhere. I mean, uh, almost always we're, we're brick to the, brick to eight feet and then, and then EFS above that. And so we're using it quite a bit and, uh, and, it, and it's going well. Uh, Linda sent me the, the most up-to-date information on, on her product, uh, and they are up to 4.25 inches of Dow Thermax being tested. 
And um, as far as board stocks go and the information I could find and the emails that I got back, that's the most for a board stock. So 4.25 inches is our cap right now. Um, and the, the fastening, the thermal bridging um, can be done right. It gets a little bit trickier here because instead of uh, doing adhesive uh, as you would in an EVE system, now we're actually putting uh, pa fasteners through. Um, mineral fiber. Mineral fiber is great because it's rocks and, um, and it, it just doesn't burn. But again, uh, for some reason, there's a lot of pushback with, with mineral fiber from a lot of architects uh, and they don't like using it. And, and the most reported on an outboard situation that I was able to find, and uh, we're, we're going to have a Q&A after this, and if anybody can prove me wrong or tell me more, I'd love to have it in this uh, presentation because we give it quite a bit, um, but is, uh, is an eight inches of mineral fiber. And, and unfortunately, well, I could probably figure it out based on the R value, but uh, I want to say that's the, the four uh, PSF. So um, water, air, and vapor. Again, once again, the thermal bridging gets a little bit more complicated here. Uh, and the reason I say that is we've opened up a number of, of problematic walls that had min mineral fiber in them, and we did see problems of, of full areas of exposed sheathing as it slumped a little bit. And so uh, that, that, that concerns me, but um, if done right and done well, it can work. Um, Demolec is in the back here, and uh, they, they provided me with uh, some information, and it to, is the most that I could find on the, on the, um, in the spray foam world. And I, again, feel free to tell me wrong. I, you know, I only have so many emails I can send out, but 3.4 inches is where spray foam limits out right now. And um, that's in R23. These, uh, these code compliance reports aren't, out, aren't even out yet from Demolec, I've been told, and they will be coming in a little bit. But um, we can go 3.4 and then the one nice thing about spray foam on the interior is you can get away with a little bit more uh, of adding that closed cell spray foam on the interior and, um, and, and boost it up a little bit without the, the negative effects of, of creating issues in the, in the cavity. So, um, man, I think night wall systems might, must be sending out some like Christmas hams or something because I think everybody's talked about them. Uh, the reason we talk about them is because they're doing some really cool things. And uh, I think we first met, uh, Harley's here, Harley and I first met about two years ago and he showed me the system and I said, that is awesome. But unless it's, a, you know, a high rise building, I, I can't get this on the building. Like this, there's not a need for it. We can paper out and there's no cost expense. And so um, I don't know if you guys have seen, uh, they have a, they have a, um, uh, they've got a display or a exhibit back in the back. So I definitely say go back and take a look at it. But they, they've got a couple different rail systems that they use that are, are light years ahead of, of competition. Um, these rail systems can be designed, and in fact, when we do cladding design, we actually have done in the past, we've got a 38-story high-rise going up in New York right now with a reclad, that it's, it's all uh, done, re, the, it's not kind of off the, off the shelf uh, rail system, um, which makes this, the price point a little bit better on these. So. Um, but we're we're very engaged with that other project. So, um, but this again um, can be done with a Dow Thermax. This can be done with uh, mineral wool. And so uh, the most we're getting on this is the 4.25. Interestingly enough, I think you can do some in, some interesting hybrid systems here where you put in a couple more barriers um, outboard of insulation, and then add more rigid, rigid insulation. But um, we're going to stick to the simple right now. Um, if you haven't seen this, their rail systems are, are very interesting uh, where they're going as far as to use gasketed stainless steel fasteners because of their, uh, because when you touch the jumper cables on the other side of the wall, it doesn't shock you half as bad. So um, actually it's like one tenth as bad. So, and here's a kind of a breakdown of their, um, of their fastening systems where they're isolating each part, they've still got the structure and, the, and basically the strength is, that is needed, but they're using the stainless steel and the gasketed uh, isolation. So here's another one. I don't know if these guys made it. They said they were going to try. Uh, is, is Cynthia in the room? They said they were going to try, try to be here. Um, very interesting and kind of a, I, I think we'll start seeing this more and more as we start pushing more and more to say, I want higher performance and this is, I don't want thermal bridging, I don't want this. And, you know, just the manufacturers respond 
but um, sometimes it takes some time. So um, the this is a you can see a picture here. It's basically a, 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 a it's a panelized framed wall uh, blank that has uh, the 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 structure actually embedded into EPS, and it gives you about an inch on the outside. Uh, where you you can actually cut down your thermal bridging. So this is your framed wall, and you can see they put it up much like tilt up. They got 30 foot uh, boards. I think they're about four feet wide, and they weigh um, a, a single man can straight can stand one of those up. Very interesting system, and they have paid to have the 285 testing done on their system. And so you see a lot of these guys coming out uh, with these new concepts and and they're putting them on certain things here and there, but don't have the funds to go after a full 285. And by the time you're, you know, five tests down the road, you're a quarter million invested, and, uh, and you're finding out you don't have a product that's going to sell. So there's a better look at, at what it looks like. Um, very interesting product. So w the biggest thing I want to just talk about is w when we're dealing with this, we need to be thinking, not just for right now when we put in, th in place to, uh, things like 285, but we need to be thinking about the future. And, um, and I, I agree, I think we'll cap out at a certain point when we're looking for continuous insulation. But I know on projects, I've already put 11 inches of continuous insulation on projects and been able to skirt the fire code with uh, certain letters. The, uh, but our, cur our current limitations for the exterior uh, continuous insulation, like I said, are, is 4.2534 for the, the SPF. Um, 13 inches, uh, it comes out to about an R70 on the eaves and the mineral fiber. It's not really, we don't really have a limitation, but uh, we're getting about 4.2 an inch on there, and, and they're, they're fine, and they're, they're not a foam, so they don't have to comply with 285. So with that said, um, I, I, I kind of echo a little bit of what Waggy said earlier. Is, is it's kind of putting us uh, a little bit in a in a of a ringer when we're trying to push the higher end. If we want to be code compliant, paper wise, um, yeah, we 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 can get there today. Um, that might change some of uh, the passive house uh, R value numbers that are being adopted through our through our northern climate zones. We're really pushing that level right now, and um, and it definitely could be a problem. So. With that, I've, I've, been try, I've been told to try and uh, make mine a little bit longer. I didn't want to repeat everything Waggy, uh, Waggy and uh, Linda said. So I've got another quick presentation here about what the future may look like. And, um, and unfortunately, I'm going to talk about the problems that that'll bring too. Um, let's see here if I go to... I hear you, Cricket. Yes, sir. Hold on to your heart. You have extra time, so. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I've got extra time. And, and I did say that. <laughs> so, um, this is a building uh, that it was it was pretty much a science experiment. Uh, well, an architectural, engineering, and science experiment, and it's uh, it's located uh, it's the Harmony Weber Center lo located at Judson University in Chicago. And um, this project is d designed by a UK architect, and so um, it, he that specializes in passive cooling design. And so I said passive cooling in Chicago in the same like set of sentences. So at this point, you guys should be throwing red flags really high. Um, this is an interesting project uh, because it's never been attempted in that kind of climate zone before to actually passively cool. It's a large building. It's located. It, it houses um, architectural studios uh, and and some administrative offices um, and some art studios. And so, what you're seeing here is, I mean, look at it. It's in our eyes, atrocious. And I hope maybe by the end of this presentation, I can let you think it's a little bit better looking than it is, because it's what it is is it's actually science at work. It's it's a bunch of different strategies all coming together, and uh, and truly a remarkable um, project. It's completely unique. It's hard to measure it against any um, one baseline, and so. But I can tell you some of the stuff as we move on here. So, this is. Um, this video, I, I just downloaded this when they came over and told me to uh, uh, 
uh, stretch this out a little bit, and so the video didn't come through. <laughs> but this is what it looks like uh, from as you as you approach it from one side. You can see a lot of different strategies involved here. The PV is truly for show. Um, they're not getting much out of that. We can all be honest. So, um, but if you look at some of the other things that are that are truly amazing, uh, you can see the the sh the window shading and and the sunken windows. And you, you uh, with when you see that, you get to see, start thinking how. How thick is that building envelope? And and uh, it's actually 18 inches, and it's a mass wall. Um, and so this is what it, basically how it breaks down. We had the block, and we had the bar. And um, what what BCRA did was BCRA was invited to come do a post uh, a post construction. Uh, basically, did the models, did all the uh, did all the modeling software, all the Nintendo engineering, did it all come together? And is it actually doing what, it, what we said it would do? And the fact is, uh, it, it didn't. Uh, it was close, but it, it didn't quite get us there. And, uh, and it's going to take a little bit of fine tuning from people that can make decisions that don't involve just a, a, a one, a zero. And, and so we, we actually have to make, uh, use our, our noggins on this stuff. So um, the block is, is over here. It's uh, five stories, one of them being underground. The bar is here, and I think it's four stories. They call this the bow tie. Isn't that cute? Um, and so basically, it, it, we're going to focus on the block here today, but if you look at uh, what we have here is we have um, down here in the center of the building is basically a, a big concrete basin for air. And air comes in, goes through that concrete basin, it's cooled, um, and then it goes up the center of the building through what we call the light well. And, and it's a completely enclosed space that um, uh, that will basically it's a very fancy air duct. And in here, at the bottom of each floor, we have uh, an automated window system that opens up each uh, at, depending on the temperature and humidity in each space, opens up those those uh, basically glazing uh, to to a certain amount, which then comes in, washes across the the floor. And then goes out through the um, stacks, out, out through the stack terminal at the top, and it's all, it all operates on a huge siphon. Um, this is this is interesting stuff when we start talking about how are we going to cut and get to uh, the high performance. And it's not just building envelope. And in fact, most of it isn't building envelope. Um, but you, I'll show you when I was brought in to be the building envelope subject matter expert, the things that we found that that could be done better. So. The design intent was load reduction. We had shading, insulation, earth berming, daylighting, and you can see um, we we did these each uh, frame around each window. You can see our, our our windows are cut way down in size. We don't have a lot of uh, of sunlight coming through the windows, and when we do have sunlight coming through the windows, we have the exact amount that we want on that day of the year, when when the sun is down. Uh, you know, in the middle, in the middle of winter, and the sun is down more towards uh, the horizon. We're taking on more to help heat our building. When it's in the summer, we've completely shaded that window from any sun, and we're still bringing in the light. We've got this big reflective frame around it, but um, but it's protected from that from that sun. And each each window frame is cut particular. So at nine o'clock in the morning, we want this much sun coming through this window at this time, and we know by it, it will heat the room this much. Uh, you know, we're talking some serious generalizations here when we build these things. And uh, anyway, you can see that there's the thickness of the of the wall, um, and uh, just some different looks at it. The top of the light well has uh, shading devices that, as you're sitting there, it's all computer automated, and and all of a sudden it will say, "I'm a little too hot in here. I'm going to close one of the shading devices 70% of the way." And um, really cool way to to use energy that's given to us from the sun. Passive cooling, stack effect, uh, ventilation, and the thermal mass. And you can see all these are the stacks going up and out the termini on the, on the, on the rooftop. Um, here's a simple diagram that I tried to explain earlier. Uh, I think you guys are kind of getting it. Um, here's the, the CFD modeling and, and what we're going to be seeing as the air comes in from the bottom, how it goes through each space and tries to cool each space. You can see we're seeing some problems here. Like this guy sitting over here in the corner, he's falling asleep. Uh, as classes get started in you know late August, uh, early September, so there's a good look at the light well uh, down the center of the block, and these are all the computer automated windows. 
that, that open up. Down here is, is where we're bringing in the air and uh, filtering it, cleaning it, and uh, up here is the light well, uh, or excuse me, the, basically the sky leak, I mean skylight, and a uh, little foreshadowing there. Um, it, interesting things, uh, it was designed by a UK architect that apparently architects in the UK have been giving a full license to say non-operable windows on this building only. In the United States, architects like to hear birds chirp and crickets chirp, and so the, op the windows have to be operable so we can be one with nature. And uh, sometimes when we're trying to separate ourselves from nature, in a, as in a building enclosure, uh, we can cause a lot of problems. Additionally, when you're trying to operate your building as a, a siphon, you don't want to put holes at random spots around the building at whenever a freshman wants to open the window. Um, and so it's kind of like uh, I explained uh, when, when you have a crack in your McDonald's straw and you get down to the bottom, you can't pick up that last inch of Coke because there's a crack and you're sucking through the crease. Anyway, you guys know what I'm talking about. So, um, so this was a problem. We had serious uh, problems and, and we actually did uh, studies showing them if you open one window, you're this much uh, off. It, uh, and basically what this was able to do is show us that we would take ourselves out of our thermal comfort by opening one window uh, in, a, in an area. Um, we also had some, some, air, uh, some air sealing problems uh, as going into the light well since the light well is supposed to operate as a uh, basically a, a siphon. Any holes that we put into it, this was the hole that was there to, so they could clean the glass at times. And so we had to go in and, and you can see that door swings right there. Um, we had to go in and seal that a lot tighter. Um, other things that happened, uh, I know you guys, building commissioning is 100% effective, but we did get up into some of these stack termini and, and these uh, computer automated systems. Some of them uh, we found weren't even connected. And so it's always good to have a good commissioning program and actually hook it up to the amazing computer devices. Um, we did uh, air sampling. We, we looked at different, uh, different ways that the building was short circuiting. and. Um, I, again, a video is not going to load here, but I, I don't know if you can see it in this picture. Do I have another picture of it? No, I don't. Anyway, we had growing men, and uh, I did this study with, uh, with, a, with a PhD from um, University of Oregon as well, and, and so she kind of kind of, you know, got us in, but we used bubbles as, as our airflow. Uh, so there's a bunch of growing men running around a building, pressurizing it, and blowing bubbles, but, um, it, but as you blow the bubbles, if you lose, use the right bubbles, you can actually have them drop to the floor and they'll roll down the whole floor, wa walkway for you. And so it's a little cleaner than smoke and it lasts longer than smoke and it, the glycerin bubbles are great. So some of us play with bubbles. Um, and there was a video of it there that didn't load because like I said, it just downloaded this. We found other things um, that, that, were, that were interesting. Uh, this one could get a little long to explain, but basically the infrared showed us for whatever reason we had a really cold leak right here, and that was where there was a, a faulty duct work. Um, the, the duct work that was bringing the cold air up through the, through the uh, light well had been uh, damaged at, at a certain point. The whole seam was broken, and we were leaking out where we were actually exhausting. So. Also, um, design changes uh, from the original intended design. There was never supposed to be a door here. Um, this whole walkway was just to serve this little um, room right here. And they, you know, the architect or the contractor said, well, it wouldn't be nice if we could enter here too as well. And um, what happened is, is if this person opened this door at the same time as this door was open, then um, we had uh, all the papers off the desks were removed because we are talking about some major uh, airflow. Um, we looked at and, and did full uh, monitoring. Uh, we used uh, hobo sensors placed all throughout the building, looking at thermal comfort. And like I was telling you, when we open a window, what happens if you know if we don't uh, do all the different scenarios to to help them be able to fine tune their computer automation system? And uh, like this could be a complete, uh, you know, everybody's thinking about the cash bar, but. You know, this might not even be enough. That, that might not even be enough incentive to stick around. But anyway, to hear all this, basically we're looking at all our thermal comfort planes and, and, and mapping out where where we've got problems, where we don't have problems. And you can see a UK architect did design this, and he stands by. This is okay. Um, we actually are out of our thermal comfort zone, 
but he says that's okay you should in the morning be fine with wearing a sweater in the afternoon taking it off um, that's kind of how they do things around there we did have the um, unique event of uh, of a terrible thunderstorm that dropped about four inches of water in about an hour and a half come through while we were in the building and gave us some great building envelope water penetration commissioning and we were able to go around and identify where we had water coming in on our very elaborate fancy window systems that that open up for them so um, that that's really where we got to be thinking we're going and I, which is kind of a laugh because well I shouldn't say laugh it's a stretch because that's this this kind of building isn't best value or low bid um, uh, and so this is this is going to uh, to a little bit uh, different uh, market but we can think this way in in simpler terms sometimes and save energy and, and come up with energy efficiencies here and there and so this is this is a great example um, it's currently saving um, 87 percent over ASHRAE 2009 um, and so it's it's doing a great job the cooling uh, what I can say is they they had a few things that didn't come in the way they thought they were going to and we have added uh, air conditioning for that gets used for probably about um, 36 days of the year that the air conditioning does uh, kind of hybrid system assist the, um, the 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 passive cooling system so um, if you're at all interested in this, this was written up a couple years ago in the Journal of Green Building, and that's a if you're having trouble sleeping, that's the one. EcoStructure uh, uh, magazine also highlighted it and in our study that we did there for them, and that has a lot of the foofier pictures and, and it's funner to look at. So um, with that, I think we're going to open it up for Q&A.